Do I have it turned down? Can you hear me? Oh, what am I doing wrong? Oh, buddy. Hey, you're there. I'm there. You. What's going on? I can't see you yet. There you are. You have that nice, like, soft focus background and instruments suggestively. I debated bringing guitars to put behind me just because I figured that would make me fit in. But then I, I thought it would also increase the poser effect. You predicted my my look. It's a good look. How do you get soft focus like that? It's so... Um, <laughs> you know what's funny is that, like, Everybody who does this asks me the same question. It's like, it's, I got a camera. I like literally when I started doing this, I went on YouTube and looked up a bunch of gamers. I was like, what's the best streaming setup? And they're all gamers. Yep. And they know tons about this world. And a lot of them suggest like this one camera, Sony Alpha 5100, which is just like an SLR just a regular camera, not a video camera. And then you connect it through another little thing called the cam link, turns it into a video camera. And this is just like the auto, the auto focus. The actual kind of auto focus settings. It looks so good. Thank you. I have, um, on, on the subject of technology, I've been doing Taggart and Torrens for, I think it's seven years now. And my voice has sounded terrible. And I've gone through, there's like a graveyard of mics behind me every new one that came out and be like, maybe that would change the thing. Turns out the file sharing service I was using was compressing it to an MP4. You would know better than me. And all I had to do was save it as a wave file. No so way. now that I've started saving it as a wave file, I have like, sounds good. And really? And... Yeah. Wow, yeah. It's crazy. You're low end. You're... It's funny because I was watching, I was going through every once in a while, I find someone's voice who sounds just like ridiculous and I can't really figure out how it is, but everything's on the internet. Do you know, there was a certain CBC radio host whose name shall never be mentioned again, who actually had the technicians on cue change the EQ or whatever to make it sound especially deep and warm and intimate. And then when a guest host would come in, uh, those settings would be readjusted. No. Were you ever a yeah. guest host? Yeah. Yeah, a okay. whole bunch. I bet crazy man. where do we even start i'm so pumped to do this with you i feel like we're kindred spirits but we we haven't ever gone to spend enough time together i know we're like so we just we it. get we pass in the night every once in a while but i mean listen it's i know I, I really appreciate you doing this i'm so glad we got to do this me too i, I just can't, i can't tell you how much i appreciate it and i have i mean i think for a lot of people in my situation too we literally grew up with you like from the get-go Street Sense. I was I was born in 81. Street Sense started what? 89, 90? Earlier. Like I, I feel like it was 88. We maybe did the first season and I joined kind of midway through. So there's a certain pocket of people who grew up without cable, often in what CBC refers to as the regions. And yeah. as, as I would say, it was before the internet. So if you wanted to know what kids in Toronto were doing, especially with Jono Vision and stuff that came later, you had to watch a TV show or wait every month for your magazine to land in the mailbox. But as far as culture goes, that's how kids got their culture. Yeah, the role of the CBC was massive, massive in terms of connecting the country. And there was a lot of regional programming. Big time. Even and it's on so television, which doesn't, I mean, it doesn't happen to the same degree anymore. It doesn't, but I, I remember going to open houses in like Charlottetown where the Supper Hour News Show has a 96% market share. Yeah. And I remember people showing up with checkbooks saying, I'd like to make a donation. Like, this is so important to us. It really is. You realize in those smaller areas that it, it was the communications railroad that tied us all together. And that's why people were stars in those days. Like Tommy Hunter was a bona fide Canadian star in the way that we have very few of now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of my like. Honestly, that's Tommy Hunter's always been like kind of the dream for me. You know what, what I mean? Like I have that kind that of show where you. I like come out and I'm like, "Hello, everybody! Here's a little song." Like, ding, 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 and then have a couple guests. That's what it's basically. I've been like willing this thing to happen for my for for my life. You know, has been like to have that because that show doesn't exist anymore. You no, know? it doesn't. Especially like 
you know, people often say, why isn't there a Canadian Saturday Night Live? Or um, I love the old timey variety show uh, combo platter of a comedy sketch and a special guest and a couple of tunes. It's also shockingly affordable is uh, uh, the main thing. Like that's not what's standing in the way of doing it. That'd be really? a great show for you. It's a great, uh, well, there's some, so many great examples. Glenn Campbell's show. If you ever watched that, Glenn Campbell had yeah. Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour, I think is what it's called. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Do you watch The Voice by any chance? Uh, not much. No. No, I don't. So I don't. Is there was a trio of siblings from Ohio this year um, called Girl Named Tom, and they did a cover of Wichita Lineman. Oh, yeah. And I've had it on a loop for six weeks since they first performed it. It's that sibling three-part harmony just phenomenal well that's why the variety show this is i mean you know since we're talking about tv variety shows are amazing because what my always my thing is is that like there are a lot of people who could blow your mind in three minutes like it's different to be able to do 75 minutes of a set or like do a full show not that that takes a lot that takes like a career to develop a full show where you have the whole audience and you know that's something you work on for years but there's like there's a lot of 16 year olds that are so good at doing something that they can blow people's minds at three minutes, whether it be on like a unicycle or a Rubik's cube or a joke. You know what I'm saying? Well, that yeah, stand up especially it takes a long time to develop an hour set. But a lot of people have three minutes. I wanted to ask you that. Did you ever do stand up? I've done it twice. <laughs> um, the first time I was on a date at whatever the Chocolatorium in Toronto and. Uh, it was one of those like where 10 people are going to get up and do five minutes and one person didn't show up and the manager was like do you want to do a set and i didn't know what the light was for at the back of the room so i stayed on for 10 minutes which is apparently gauche and uh, like no act and I, I wouldn't have the hubris today to attempt to do stand up with no act uh interestingly enough uh mark forward a stand-up comic and a canadian comedian and great actor was a bartender there and we became friends years later. And he was like, you know what? I was there for that. You, you were great. So I, I don't really remember what I said. I think I leaned on crowd work quite a bit. Um, but you yeah. Like just messing I, with the people in the audience? Yeah. Like hack, where are you from? Any fun celebrating birthdays? Like this is the thing as a, a sort of character, like more of a sketch comedian. I tend to default to characters. So cartoonish versions of whatever I'm trying to be. So as a game show host, I'd probably, you know, become this guy a little bit instead of just being me hosting a game. Um, so I think that's probably what I did in a stand-up setting too. Like, oh, what else can I tell you? Like all those hacky tropes that you see stand-ups doing. So like versus... you become the stand-up comedian. Like you are impersonating exactly. the stand-up comedian. Right, right, interesting. Exactly. Whereas someone like Mark Forward, for example, I remember the... Um, pivot he made from if he was having a bad night what's wrong with me to if he's having a bad night what's wrong with you the audience like that it requires a level of swagger and confidence in your material that takes a long time i can only i mean i always think about like difficult entertainment careers you know what i mean and i would put like Music actually might be on the higher end of, of accessibility. It, it is. People love music, right? And then comedy is like, it's a, it's a hard game to get going, working for you. You know, people who are stand-up com comics, I really admire them because it, they get, to make a name for yourself, you've got to grind it out. And then like contemporary dance is on the far end of commitment. You know what I mean? Like that is... You got to love it. You got to love it. And you got to be... If you are making a career as a contemporary dancer, you are ridiculously good by the way if you're making a living in the arts in canada i think i remember reading something that would suggest you're in the top five percent of artists like it's, it's only five percent of people that um bill themselves as artists that can do this for a living wow so i think i used to have a lot more p and v about judging people's work like man that's not funny or why did that show blow up when i was in my 20s now i'm like Man, if you're paying your rent, you did it. That's how I Good feel. Good for you. Absolutely. There's definitely a change that happens where you're like, man, anybody who can, because you realize that people's careers, they build in such different ways. I mean, you must have this too, because you built a television career. 
Now you live in Truro. So in some ways it looks like totally different from your average career in television. You know what I mean? Like how do those conversations go when you meet television people in LA and stuff? And they're like, Hey, so what are you up to? And you're like, well, I live in Truro. I got a family. And they're like, what? I kind of feel like I've pulled off the greatest ruse of all time because I, I, I was having this epiphany this morning. My wife and I start every day in the barn. And the thing I love about the barn is there's horse shit and you shovel it in a wheelbarrow. There's a concrete outcome. It's the same every day in the barn, no matter what's happening in the world. And I realized, I was thinking about you and us talking today and curious to know how your past year and a half has been because I've had some sheepishness around really enjoying it. And it, it's pretty East Coast to feel like I'm uncomfortable saying out loud that I'm happy. But I realized as freelancers and as artists, we never know what's coming next. If you have a month long runway, that's pretty incredible. So we've been training for this uncertainty our whole lives. The financial part of it aside, and the uh, mental health part of it aside, the not knowing what's coming next is actually my really comfortable default. And in fact, anytime I think, man, the uncertainty is a lot in this part of the business, I imagine trading it for the certainty that comes with working in an office environment or, or knowing what the next 50 years looks like. And that actually gives me hives. Yeah, right. And obviously continually gives you hives because you've never bailed. You've no. never bailed on the on the television. You know, I mean, have there been points in your career where you have been like, okay, sh you know, game's up? Well, I've been thankful, especially the last year and a bit, that I don't just do one thing because if I was relying on acting on a sitcom, for example, in Canada, there's a bit of a, he's had his turn. Who else's turn is there? Um, so I've discovered that kind of uh, guest character or, uh, well, it's J-Rock. It's Noah Dick on Letterkenny. It's someone who's there every few episodes. You're happy to see them. They yeah. never overstay their welcome. That's kind of the sweet spot for me because it allows people to accept me as these different characters. Whereas if I was still trying to be J-Rock as a middle-aged dude, like the show started 20 years ago, I don't think that would be creatively satisfying. Um, and it certainly wouldn't wouldn't cover my gas. So I have always felt it's important to do a whole bunch of things at once, partially because I have a short attention span and partially because it's not enough to just be J-Rock. Really? I mean, were people surprised? That's a great example because J-Rock was cooking, right? Like J that show was growing, growing, growing. It, it moved into the States. It had Netflix. J-Rock was a big part of the show. Like what, was that a hard decision? I must, it, it's funny because I looked at that from the outside. I'm sure lots of other people did and went, man, like that's a big, big thing to stop doing. Yeah, um, I guess historically I have tended to leave before the audience did. Yeah. And I've kind of gotten a little bit lucky uh, with that timing wise. I left Street Sense when it was still quite popular, started John Vision. Uh, CBC wanted another season of that. I felt like I was kind of done. That allowed me to be J-Rock. Kind of felt like my time in Trailer Park had come to an end. Um, Mr. D came along. I think that's what's allowed me to have a career versus a role. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's scary because I realized in my 20s, I was vacillating between work and worry. And there was never a time when I was just living. So I think some of that comes with time and age and uh, experience. So far, something has always come along. Um, I've learned the power of the word no in the last five or six years. And I was thinking about that this morning too. We're so critical about how we spend our money, but we don't give the same attention to how we spend our time. And so saying no to things that I feel like aren't a good fit, the worst case scenario is that I have more time at home with the people that I love that's a great outcome. So I've been trying to shift from what do I have to do to what do I want to do? Yeah, and right. that, that to me is, is that's power. That's the only flex I would ever make. Right. It's interesting because then it changes from ideally, I've been thinking about this a lot. My, you know, it's like, then it's not, I have to do this today, but I get to do this today. Yeah. Subtle distinction, you know, but like, really a game changer, isn't it? 
it's a game changer. I think about that a lot now. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I get to have this conversation. I get to do this podcast now, like, because it was something I wanted to do or whatever, you know, but then if you can start thinking about that, where it's like, oh, I get to go do a show tonight with two of my best friends on stage. It's a, it's a hard little switch to make in your head, but it's really easy to be in the situation where you're like, I have to do this. Even, even, when, you're trying to, even when you're optimistic. Well, yeah, and I'm op an optimist by nature. I'm wired that way, and I get the sense you are too. Um, oh, yeah. And in the last year and a half, um, I've had to still generate content, for lack of a better word, and I've had frustrating moments. Technology is not really my comfort uh, zone. I've been duct taping iPads to tree branches to film myself doing stuff. And in the middle of the frustration, I've realized by distilling the whole process down, it's reminded me what I loved about it in the first place. So I would rather do a smaller show and collect a smaller paycheck, but more of them with less meddling because that's the trade-off, right? Yeah. If there are more trucks, there's more people, there's more voices, there's more money, there are more chefs. I'd rather do the tiniest dish that is kind of what I meant and sleep in my own bed. And that's not what drives everyone, but that that kind of balance, that's the good stuff, man. Do we made two TV shows had... in Truro this year. Really? Yeah. I wondered if that wasn't because you've had the experience of being in obviously like larger production settings. Like Letter Kenny this must is, be a pretty big production setting, isn't it? It's huge. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. Um, but it has become huge uh, as it's traveled and found an audience. And uh, the thing that I, I love about that show is Jared Kiso, who is the creator of the show, um, super loyal to his crew, knows everyone by name, super humble. Like he's one of us. He's a, he's, he's a good dude. And at this age and stage, I just want to make good stuff with nice people. And sometimes on the bigger stuff, that's not uh, the mood. Yeah. And I, I just think, especially in a comedy show, if you're, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. So I feel like on, on the smaller stuff, I can at least control the temperature and create a kind of playful environment. And that's when the good stuff happens. For sure. For sure. And now we're in a situation like, technologically though there are downsides to being people who i'm not the same way like i'm not a i've become a tech guy but a year and a half ago i literally didn't know anything it was like watching youtube videos but like honestly the technology allows us to do smaller things it allows us to kind of skip out on some of those bigger technological or like bigger production situations but still get to people still create something that's funny i mean Tegra and exactly. you guys were doing that on on your eye on your on your computers just talking to each other right is that how you guys did it from the beginning yeah, it's basically a long distance phone call once yeah. a week, like catching up with a friend. But when Clattenburg and I, for example, were working at Street Sense and we wanted to make a short film, we would fill out these video fact applications to make music videos on film. We'd include a black and white element. So we'd buy black and white film. When we delivered it in color, we would say the black and white didn't turn out. Meanwhile, we were hoarding film till we had enough black and white film to make a short film on black and white. Like you can make a film on this tonight that would yeah. look and sound better than anything we ever made. So the thing that I love about this moment in technology is um, Street Sense, your grandmother watched and your four-year-old nephew watched and everyone kind of sat through it because there weren't that many options. Now you can have the 1989 Honda Civic YouTube page and everyone with a 1989 Honda Civic is like, this is the best. We learned that really quickly. We did um, a, a web series called Your Two Cents, which is kind of like Street Sense for 20 somethings. And our first episode was Arkells on the cost of touring, game of phones, and paying down student loans. And we learned really quickly that if you're not an Arkells fan these days, you're not going to sit through that four minutes to get to game of phones. So we couldn't even put out an episode of something. We had to junk it up into little pieces. Right. Because it's ultra the, specificity the user experience all the time. is so tailored. Yeah. 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 It's like me looking up what the best streaming, what the, you know, getting reviews on the friggin' Alpha, Alpha 51 exactly. or whatever this is. Yeah. No, it's an interesting way to start consuming. And now I have like my, my brother's teenage kids are here right now, 16 and 13. I got young, I got nine and six, but 16 year olds, that's how they consume everything. It's so fun so does, to hang out with them. It's so fun to hang out with them right now because I'm like, Wow, do they watch is... TV? 
They watch a little bit of TV, but they watch YouTube. And everything's, right. you know, and they watch sports. They watch sports on TV. But And this is the mind melter. Like, my girls are 12 and 10. You have two girls, right? Yeah, yeah, nine and six. Nine and six. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> um, so I spend days and walks and time staring at a blank screen trying to come up with a great idea for a show that's uh, an interesting mystery or an unexpected turn. What has a billion views on YouTube? A set of hands opening Kinder Eggs. Yeah. Like we're, we're trying too hard, man. Well, it's just like you can't get, I think this is it. This is, this is what I like about what you're saying too, right? Is that like you can't guess. Everybody's guessing. I and mean, if you try to guess, you're going to fail, right? Like if you were then be like, oh man, Kinder Eggs are the big thing. I got to make a video with Kinder Eggs. Like this is kind of yeah, how exactly. we approach the business for a long time. Music is like this. I'm sure TV is like this. You get one thing that's cooking. Next thing you know, there's 10 other things that look like the thing that's cooking. And it doesn't really, it's not how it works. Like, so you can see that. And then it, it, YouTube's made it extreme because then it's like, whatever that, what's that crazy like audio thing where the, you can hear everything? SM. A ASMR, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like Who I can look at that and be that like, that's really popular. Maybe I should get on board. But like, it doesn't work that way. It's kind of, which is, I think, good. It doesn't reward people who are chasing it. You kind of have to do what you were talking about, which is like, comedy is supposed to be fun. Let's have some fun. Let's be silly. Let's take some big risks. Like risk. There's so little. Like it, it, there's so little cost to risk when it comes to internet stuff, which I think is amazing. It's a big risk if you're saying, okay, I'm going to start a variety show and I'm going to have a, even if it's low cost, you know what I mean? I'm going to bring in a ten piece band and we're going to have a big studio. That's there's a certain amount of risk. Whereas like even with this podcast, I was like, might as well. I heard Mark Maron well, do it, and I was like, I want to talk to people for like a long time about whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's and the then I was like, well, I guess I right try. It doesn't cost any money. Well, one of the things that I picked up, by the way, it, it reminds me of the joke in TV, which is when people pitch a show that's like, it's Shit's Creek meets Letterkenny. Oh, I see. So it's two extremely popular shows. That's what your show is going to be like. That's that's cheating. You don't know <laughs> if that will land. Um, I would I would happily produce your variety show, by the way. I would love to do that. That would be uh, super fun for me. And I think we could do it for a reasonable amount of money and have a blast. Really? Yeah. I would, I would love that. I mean, it's been my dream. I've been kind of like speaking it out. You know what I mean? Like I've been kind of saying it, but it, it, was, a, it was a situation where it was like, I knew that if, it, to do it, I'd have to do it on my own. It was, or, or like with someone else, not in a big, big, it wouldn't be the CBC that would do it likely. Maybe they That's would. That's the but... thing. They should. And by the way, I've pitched a version of this show regionally. They should too, even though they don't have a whole lot of dough in the regions. Um, but I, I always find the uh, abstract, unidentified worst case scenario is so much worse then when you actually ask yourself, what is the worst thing that could happen? We make this thing and no one watches. Okay. That's right. Like really that that's the worst. That's not a problem. That's a ticket thing off your list that you always wanted to do. Right. Yeah. Like, so you must have those. Ex I, I agree. And I love this idea, by the way, I would like, would be absolutely thrilled. It's something be great. It would be so fun. And it's something I've always wanted to do, but I do find that- uh, I, I even know where we can do it, by the way. I did a, a video for the, uh, you know, the old World Trade Center and it's now where 22 Minutes shoots. Yeah. They owe me a few studio days. Do it there. Amazing. I love the idea of just doing it independently. I mean, this is the thing. Not that I don't love the CBC, again, that, but it's, it allows you to take risks and figure it out, make it figure out what it, what it looks like. Again, like I'm, I love working in environments where it's, I like the small groups. I love small groups. My most, my most uh, exciting experiences from a collaboration expect, I, I do, I, I enjoy big groups once they're cooking, but I do love that low risk, high creativity moments. It's what I've had with, when I work, when I worked with Classified, it was just, when I still work with him, when I work with anybody I work with, when I made my French record, all of those experiences were, let's just get down to, scrape away everything else all the red all it's just to the to the actual making the thing as you're saying you're saying the same thing i just didn't know it was even possible to do on tv because i always think of it as being so cost prohibitive right well my thing is the less people the more of a vested interest everyone has in the outcome 
I create an environment on our sets, for example, where the grip can offer up a joke. And if it gets in the show, they go home that night at dinner and they're proud and they're talking up the show and they're going to work harder because they uh, own it more. The more trucks, the more stuff, the more people, the less anyone cares. Generally speaking, there are exceptions, as I mentioned, like Letterkenny. But generally speaking, it, people are kind of phoning it in. I love, my deal is, I don't ask for favors at this stage in my career. I don't want to do the $100 a day club. I want everyone to make their best day rate. So don't, uh, don't show up for free or cut your rate in half. Make what puts a smile on your face, but we just don't have more people than we need. Yeah. So as long as everyone's in, it's the best. So how do you, when you, do you produce TV now? Like, has this become a big part of your, your world? Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly how. Taggart and Torrens was in development at a major Canadian network for two and a half years. And I had a variety show, not unlike the one you're talking about in development, at another major Canadian network for two and a half years to ultimately be told we're not going to proceed with this. I was like, man, the thing I didn't like about living in L.A. is I felt so arm's length from the process. A casting director had to talk to a director, had to talk to a producer to see if they cast the other role to see if I would be a good fit. You're just waiting pacing like a caged lion around your apartment, waiting for the phone to ring. I felt so not in control of my own destiny. So I thought if I come back to Canada, at least I can get access to these people at the networks in Canada. But realistically, if you're CBC and you're gonna put together a variety show maybe, there might be 10 people on the list, right? Some David Miles is, a couple of Jerry D's, a Steve Patterson or two, Jessica Holmes would be a great person on that list. Um, there aren't enough opportunities. So they're looking for reasons to say no, as opposed to reasons to say yes. Um, so I didn't like those odds. So I thought technology is cheaper than it's ever been. I'm gonna start making the stuff that I wanna make and then either find a sponsor to pay for it or find a network. But the great thing about the internet is it's the great equalizer because I don't need someone at CBC to say, you can do this. I can just do it. And it's how Letterkenny hit. Jared did a few different um, kind of sketch series on the web and this one just took fire. So I would rather uh, invest in the one variable I can control, which is myself. I know what I can do as opposed to in this, part of the country, there's a proud tradition of crossing your arms and sitting on the couch, the must be nice stuff. Man, it must be nice. People in Toronto get everything, man, there's so much money up there, man, it must be nice. I'd rather just execute the ideas that I have and see. Right. So well, I mean, we have Canadian I... content studios now. We've made a couple of shows in Toronto, as I mentioned, um, doing a bunch of corporate work. We shot a pilot called Turd Talks, which is like uh, TED Talks about uh, a time someone soiled themselves super highbrow stuff oh, we made a my series dad, my dad CBC speaking bought. of variety shows and soiling yourself my dad soiled himself in front of ed sullivan and i'm not making it up he had he had been traveling back from india in like the late 60s i just told my kids this story and he had like very he had a terrible stomach bug and he was in they they had stopped in france on the way home or something this was a big trip before they had kids they decided to do this big trip overland. It was nuts, but then they flew to get home. And they were in France and they were on a patio and Ed Sullivan was there and their friends who he's at the table with were like, oh, we gotta go say hi to Ed Sullivan. And he was like, no, I'm not going. And they went over to say hi to Ed Sullivan. They were talking to Ed Sullivan. And he was like, I gotta get out of here. And he went over to say bye to his friends. And as he moved towards them, he, he, he soiled himself. He crapped his shorts. And he had to run through the hotel with his shirt over his head. This is how he's always told it. He's gone. He can't confirm uh, my father is with no a longer. shirt over his head. He was so embarrassed. He was terrified. He was literally so he was crapping his pants, running away from Ed Sullivan. I'm not. <laughs> I have so many questions. I know. I have so many questions. Anyways, it just I don't know why you said you have a show on people crapping their pants. And I'm like, well, there's there's our family lore. That's always been around. Do you know that for a fact that Ed saw this? Well, he said he was right beside Ed Sullivan. Like Ed Sullivan was oh sitting my there. Gosh. 
that's one of those like I could never top that story. That well, is, it seems that's absurd. the best story ever. And I've heard it so many times throughout my life that I was like, it can't be. But my mom confirms it. And my mom's not one. My dad was dramatic. Like, my dad loved Showtime. So I could always, I didn't know if, like, over time, this thing had become more extreme. It became, you know, white tennis shorts and, like, the perfect scenario. Right. You get to add on. <laughs> you get to Lego that story. <laughs> totally. But at the same time, I feel like more details would make it less good. Like it's it's the perfect story that if you if you embellished, it would take away from its natural slam dunkery. It is a slam. I mean, just Ed Sullivan and pooping your pants in the same story. And France, like like all it's of a it, win. It's, it's a win. Well, it's a, it's lot a one inch putt. But I think that. <laughs> I think it's also like, I guess not to, not to distract into stories about crap in your pants, but the best part about them is that at the time, they're never, they're the furthest thing from a win. Yeah. Like it's only perspective. Yes. You know, I, I've had moments where, you know, where you're in those moments where you're like, this is so bad. But then you kind of, even sometimes you can kick at a little glimmer in the back of your head where you're like, this is going to make a really funny it story. It will make a great story someday. <laughs> we will um, laugh at this. This is one of the things I love about doing Taggart and Torrance. Taggart was obviously in uh, Our Lady Peace for 20 years. And this is what I always wonder. Like, surely over the time touring, you must have ailments. Um, a blister on your thumb, for example, as a drummer would be super painful. Do you play through it? When do you tell 10,000 people, sorry, we can't perform tonight. What is the line? So in his case, uh, they were opening for Van Halen, outdoor show, sunset right here, and he had a migraine. So he turned his drums around facing away from the stage and played with a bucket beside him vomiting into it. You must have some tales of woe Oh my goodness. I mean, I've told, I've like, yeah, especially in the last, like just before the pandemic, like I got part of the reason why I like having these conversations is a lot of the conversations end up being like, what, what do you do to maintain an emotional balance, spiritual balance in a creative career? Because that part's really hard. There's the pressure of uncertainty. How do you match yeah. the pressure of uncertainty with any kind of stability? And, and the reason I've been, you know, interested in asking these questions is because I had kind of a burnout situation and how it manifested itself was i was getting facial hives like crazy wow. facial swelling but like day, like it's stress stress related we never really not yeah but then other things too you know there was just like some un uh you know my my um thyroid wasn't really operating as it should and there was just but stress was obviously a factor because it was happening when i went on tour and i went on this particular tour in ontario and it was happening like every second day but like i, I it was kind of happening at weird times but it was like my lips would my lip would blow up like i'll send you a photo of this thing and it will blow your mind it is just so crazy how crazy i looked and then it happened on this tour and it happened a lot but it happened really bad at the first tour i played in peterborough at market hall you've probably been there great theater had a great show, woke up the next morning, was having coffee with my sister-in-law and we were having a coffee. And then all of a sudden I was like, mm, something's not right. I can feel some swelling. And within like 20 minutes, my bottom lip was enormous, crazy, crazy swelling. But I had to do a show that night. And so my, my lip was in, like my face was crazy looking. I, I'll, and so do you shine a light on it or do you just pretend it's not happening? That you night have to I had the people to. in, right? That yeah. night I had to. I had to, which is like, it's that thing. It's like the cracked windshield. You don't notice it until you notice it. But I felt like they were going to notice this thing. Like this thing was massive. And of course we were, again, we thought, well, we'll probably laugh at this in the in the future. I remember the next day, Al, Al Jeffries, who plays guitar in the band, has played forever. We were walking through... Picto. We were playing, or in Picton. We were playing in Picton, Ontario. And he was walking by and he was like, man, I don't know how you're not freaking out right now. <laughs> I was like, that oh is God. not helping. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying not to freak out. And then we did a show at a high school in Cold River. Deep, yeah, deep. Is that what it's called? It's up by Chalk River. It's by the, by uh, like north of Petawawa on the Ottawa River. And um, we were playing up there and I got it the next morning and I was had to play for a high school. 
And that to me was, that was my moment, which was like, I look insane. I'm playing folk music for kids in high school who already think I'm a total nerd. Like I'll get up there and I'm like doing my thing with my suit and tie and everybody else and we're doing our thing, which is already tricky in a high school environment. And then I have this insane lip and I remember getting in the car afterwards and I was like, I think that might've been the most courageous thing I've ever done. <laughs> That's the thing, the surge of adrenaline and pride that comes after surviving those moments. Like I've had so many of those, like, how did I get here? What am I doing here? What is the point of this? And the biggest, most life-changing one was I auditioned for a casino commercial in Los Angeles. And the guy who was uh, running the audition was like a Larry from Three's Company guy. And I'm a terrible auditioner. I'm a Canadian, I'm from the East Coast. I'm apologetic by nature, I'm self-deprecating. A gene, by the way, that Americans do not have. So when I would go in for an audition, I would apologize midway through, like, sorry guys, it's almost done, bear with me. Like, what are you doing? You're a traveling salesperson. The product is you're selling is yourself and you're telling us not to buy it. Um, so this audition was uh, uh, alone in a room in this warehouse with this guy who's like, here's the thing, you're auditioning for a casino, you're killing it, you know, everybody loves a winner. I'm gonna get you to roll the fake dice down the fake table and you won again. So I wanna see that in your face. So I'm by myself in a room going like, yeah, like needed a tongue scraper. Like, I'm not really buying that you're winning. We'll try it again, like something more fun. So uh, did it again. Um, he turned on music to make me feel like I was really in the zone. Uh, and I just yelled, I'm dying inside. And he was like, what's that? And I was like, nothing, man. And I left and I got in the car and I called my mom who was back in Halifax. Um, she had a dentist appointment the next day. She was kind of scared to go. And I was like, do I want to be the guy that drove his mom to the dentist? Or do I want to be the guy that booked a casino commercial? And it was a really clear answer in that moment. And I moved home. That wow. Was I really was wondering if there was a distinct moment when you were like, okay, this is it. That was this it. Is, I, I'm I dying there, inside. I'm dying inside. I, I was 30 years old. I'd worked at CBC for 15 years. And so the natural thing to do was go to LA to answer the what if question. What would happen if I went there? And it wasn't as anything as I thought it would be. Um, I've said before, my, my impression of LA as a kid from outside of Charlottetown was the montage in Pretty Woman where Richard Gere is driving the, the Lamborghini around the block. I thought, I thought that was what Los Angeles was. Everyone had diamond collars and implants and Ferraris. It's not that. The business isn't like that. I worked a ton. I made great friends, but it just wasn't home. And so yeah. that was one of those little moments where I realized what was important to me. And at, at that point, there wasn't a gig down there. The Tonight Show wouldn't have been more important than coming home. Really? Yeah, I had a very similar situation. I remember after I got sick and I came back, I thought, I got to I got to readjust a major readjustment. I mean, now I live in Fredericton. Part of that move was was because I wanted to be closer to my mom and I wanted to have a different kind of life. I, I, I wasn't going to pursue it at the same at the same speed or in the same lane, which was touring 50 percent of the year, 60 percent of the year, going, going, going with the, you know, hopefully cracking into the states and you know, James Taylor kind of thing. And I remember saying to Sherry, my manager at one point, I remember I was like, I'm, I feel so disconnected that if, if James Taylor called me right now and said, I want you to come open the show, I would say no. And it's a similar place, you know, where well, you're this like, is the thing. I thought I was pursuing this. I thought that was the lane I was pursuing. And now I'm, I'm realizing that that's not, but the, it was took a long time to then realize, well, that doesn't mean that I'm not still in entertainment and I'm not still in music and I'm not still involved in this thing that I love in the deepest of my heart. It's that it's not going to look like this. That's the thing. And it, in, in part, it took being near people who did make it in that stratosphere that were still not content. And in fact, there is a whole different series of problems that come with that level of fame, especially in America. And, and I uh, certainly never experienced it, but witnessed it and it doesn't look fun. Um, so I, I, I realized uh, I do a lot of corporate work in the States. Um, 
I have, I have three criteria I use to pick a gig, fun, money, challenge. And anything I do has to have two of them. Um, I love the fun challenge ones because they're often, do you want to play a crazy character that unlike anything you've ever done before? Yes, I do. But anytime I've done something just for one, it's usually money. It's not been satisfying. So when you have kids, your definition of fun changes. My biggest fear is that everyone will get used to me being away and me being home actually throws a wrench in the works because it was working just fine. And I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah. It's the worst. Oh, yeah. Been away for a couple of weeks. You come home and it throws the equilibrium off. Terrible feeling. Um, so my uh, quest is to find a way to balance these two, this chocolate and the peanut butter in a way that doesn't naturally go together. So for example, I have a bunch of gigs in the States this winter. We're taking the girls. Right. We have a motor home. We're taking them out of school and we're going to do it as a family. And they will learn different stuff than they would here in school. Um, but that's, that's a way I can swing it. Yeah, I, yeah. I find it sad to be away. Yeah, I do too. I find it harder, but a lot of it is about imagining, right? A lot of it, I feel like a lot of this is about imagination. Part of the reason why I like having these conversations is because in, com in conversing with other people, you're able to imagine. I think what happens is on the outside and when you're getting into the career, it's really easy to think again, like that there's one track that you do this, you do this, you do this, and then this happens. And then as you do it for longer, I remember when I, uh, when I first found out about Buddy What's His Name and the other fellers, and I was like, you know, grinding it out. And then I, you know, learned about their business model. Killing they it. Like, they would do 14 nights at the Arts and Culture Center in St. John's or something, 12 or 14 nights. Like they'd play to 9,000 people. 12 and, times in a row. <laughs> over the two weeks, you know, or whatever. 10,000 over the two weeks. Yeah, exactly. 1,000 people a night. And then they would go to Fort McMurray and do two weeks up there. And you're like, what? They're, they're operating at completely outside of the, they're not, you know, on the front of billboard. They're not winning Junos. They're not in the, in the limelight at all. Meanwhile, they're crushing it in their domain. Crushing it. Right. There's, <laughs> and these corporate gigs that I do in the States, there's a revenge of the nerds style band for peace. They dress like revenge of the nerds play eighties covers tighter than you've ever heard. And they go from take on me to hungry, like the wolf to time after time, they're making $75,000 US a night. No. And they're so busy that they've cloned themselves twice. There are three versions of this band. And so Tuesday night might be the Xerox national sales meeting. And Wednesday, it's whatever insurance company. And people in Levi's Dockers are losing their minds dancing to every <laughs> song that rings their nostalgia bell. They just they're found doing one it at the highest thing. level. Yeah found one thing and they do it you've never heard of them and they are making like 50 cent money right it's bananas and they're having a blast imagination imagination you know it's imagination it's being able to imagine a different model like obviously there was a point at which you had to say you leave la and it's like i can imagine not only am i going to move to nova scotia i'm going to move to truro i'm going to imagine life with kids and a partner and a, and a barn, apparently. I didn't know about the barn. Well, yeah. <laughs> I guess the thing is, um, my wife is from here. Her folks are here. Uh, mine are both gone. Uh, my girls can see their grandparents every day. Um, we live on a dirt road. What I do factors so little into who we are here. Um, I love that. I like to live in the quiet and visit the noise occasionally, but I, feel like my uh, creative well is so um, continuously filled here by uh, the interactions that I have with neighbors and people in my town. And it's idyllic. The novelty is totally worn off that uh, J-Rock lives <laughs> in a farmer's field outside right. of town. There was one when Snoop Dogg was on Trailer Park Boys, I think it was season 10. I was there um, that focus. day. Yeah, class came down and did a <laughs> track with him, right? Somehow a rumor got started that Snoop and I were playing catch with a football on my front lawn. <laughs> and there was a lot of traffic on our dirt road that day. But generally speaking, it's a super quiet existence. And I love that. 
Yeah, and it does allow you to, as you said, like to replenish the well. Like this is, the, again, the long career looks really different than the short career. It really it does. does, and, and it requires a replenishing of the well. And you can go hard in your 20s, but it's a very different thing to have a second decade, decade of a career, a third decade. In your case, you're on your third, this is your third decade of being a television person, which is rare. Yeah. Well, this is the interesting thing. The last year was the first time since I was 15 that the bulk of my income didn't come from acting on television. Wow. And it came from I'm where? 49. It came from, that's great. And it came from production. Came from uh, real estate. Came from uh, corporate gigs. Came right. from my wife's store. Uh, she has wow. a clothing store at Sunnyside Mall. It came from uh, renting trailers out to movies and TV shows. Yeah. And some TV, but I was completely happy with that. It made me um, ask myself, who am I aside from Buddy on TV? Because mm -hmm. my whole life has been, oh, there's that guy from that show. And kind of two things happened. One is I've been Buddy on less TV shows than I ever have. And two, the interaction is very different because it used to be, you're the guy from Street Sense. I am. I saw that piece you guys did about illegal curves and hockey sticks. Cool. I actually have a stick with an illegal curve. Oh, no way. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Now the interaction is, you're, um, aren't you, uh, you're, uh, right? There's no eye contact. There's no nice to meet you. There's no handshake. There's no genuine connection. It's grabbing a picture for the gram and that's it, which is actually an unsatisfying exchange. Yeah, I when you're in the I don't get room. anything from that. Right. And you love people probably. Like I love people. I love having a real chat with people. It's fun as heck. Yeah, I like that. I my work is very social. My life is very not. <laughs> but I'm nosy and I'm curious and I like to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah, I would say my life is extremely small here in Fredericton. I mean, obviously the pandemic lends itself to a small life. But I generally, I, I'm the same way. I, I, but I didn't, I took a long time to learn that. I took a long time to learn that. I was kind of firing on all, I felt like I love people. I do love people. I love being social. I love being out. But then I would like, it was that moment where I would close the hotel, the hotel door and be like. And sob. <laughs> kind of just be like, I am wasted. I'm so tired. I'm depleted because I wasn't really thinking about how much I could keep up. You know what I'm saying? And so well, and that, that nonverbal energy, the this, yeah. that, that is exhausting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I appreciate where you're coming from because I've, I feel like I've now much of my situation now, my whole outlook on doing the gigs that I'm doing is more like, again, I get to do them. I've chosen to do them. I'm really excited about them. And then my time away from doing them is way more like replenishing. Like I have a, it's, exactly. it's, it's hilariously replenishing, but I, I kind of justify it because I feel good when I'm doing the things I want to do now. I'm engaged. I got the energy to do them. And not that I didn't, but I, but my health was sacrificed. You know, I don't think I put on bad shows, but I also knew that I wasn't, that wasn't going to go, that wasn't going to continue. But isn't that interesting how life comes along and taps you in the shoulder in that regard? I feel like I'm glad you're well, you look well. And this timing is kind of fortuitous, isn't it? That you had time to be home and lick your wounds and recalibrate and all that stuff. And I think uh, history will show that the pandemic was kind of like a fast forward button for a lot of people, because if you're not living where you love with the person you love, doing what you love, I think a lot of people are hopefully gonna come out the other side of this going, wait a sec, life's too short. I wanna do that. Right, I hope so. I hope so. Certainly a lot of people have moved home. Holy smokes. Frederick well, it costs is a living pumping. too. <laughs> yeah, it is. The real estate market's bananas. It is. It is. But you know, it's it's great. It's great to see people here and enjoying enjoying life here in a smaller place and with different, you know, priorities. And I mean I guess working from home too has opened things up for them, you know. But I do. I am optimistic. I want to believe that that's the case. I know it's probably absolutely horrible for a lot of people during this time, but I think that you know, if, if it does, it fast forwards, it almost fast forwards everybody into a, in a, a different future very quickly. You know, technologically. Well, that's why the whole, we're all in this together thing was a bit of a lie. 
because our experiences might have been somewhat similar, but I kept thinking about people in a bachelor apartment at Young and Bloor on the 37th floor when early on in, in the thing when no one really knew what it was. And I, I remember being at Mass Town Market and we needed milk. And it was like the early days of AIDS when people thought you could get it from a toilet seat. It was like, is getting milk worth dying maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine the impact of that stress on someone by themselves in a small space away from home. Every elevator button, every escalator handrail, thinking you're taking your life into your own hands. Like we haven't seen the impact of that. Like tension is not supposed to be sustained for two years. Yeah, it's a long time to be yeah. freaking if you're no wired doubt, that no way. No doubt, in the urban environments are so much more pronounced. As you said, they I did live like everybody's in it together. My experience is completely different than someone who's trucking. Yeah, who's like in a truck, driving a truck across the border all the time, delivering food, and you know, yeah. I read I read a story early on in the pandemic of truckers, you know, not being able to go into truck stops and living in their truck, not being able to come home and see their family in between their trips because they had to they'd been traveling around. I was like, this is intense. So, you yes. know, I, I, I like to keep that in mind, but I, and I am grateful, but I do, I do feel like those moments in our lives, pandemic aside, but the, you know, the health moment or you doing the, the, that, the uh, casino ad, they're, they're sometimes the most important. They become more important than J-Rock in some ways, right? Like they become the big, the big markers. Like I think about a lot of my big gigs. And I think I, I've, I, we've done some great gigs. I look at them so fondly now. But I also think that like actually in the scheme of my whole life, the those terrible nights with the friggin' facial hive was probably among the most important. I asked uh, my kid who's 12 years old and um, glitter, pink, dance, unicorns, uh, just a wonderful free spirited angel um, said she wanted to play hockey. And I said, what is it about hockey that you like the idea of? And she said, um, driving to games with friends, uh, matching track suits, uh, staying in hotels, the hotel might have a pool. And I bet after games, you could probably get pizza delivered to the hotel. So she's on like item six or seven of the list, hasn't mentioned a puck, skating the object of the game but when i shared this with hockey people they're like that's what we remember too yeah it's it's the stuff around the thing that that's is why often the people matter the that's why the people matter that's why when you say like you know the, the the people on a crew when you're working with the right people it is the most exciting and most fun it is such a fun job i mean it i just love the creative pursuit with people that you love, there's just it's nothing the better. There's nothing better. I mean, when you guys- And laughing cooking, and no one knows why you're laughing. Like oh that- God, I that was just watching that trailer. I mean, I know that people watch it all the time. It has like a freaking millions of views as you doing the know, know what I'm saying thing. And it's, but you guys are going, you guys are, they're laughing like crazy. They can't stop laughing. And it, I think the reason it's so popular is because you get a sense of the energy on the set when it was re when it's really cooking and when you guys are literally just cracking jokes to try to make each other laugh basically between takes too like especially the first couple of seasons sitting around on coleman coolers with egg salad sandwiches from the irving in it and we brought clothes from home and no one had any idea what it was or would be i i remember thinking like there's no way people will find this funny so it's it's bananas that it's still funny and that it's traveled as far as it has thanks to Netflix. Um, but like everything, when uh, things get big or, uh, you know, find a big audience or the, a whole other layer of opportunity encroaches, that changes things. I'm sure it's the same for fans too. I remember reading this Dave Bedini wrote a book called On a Cold Road. Mm -hmm. Have you read it? It's amazing. It He's about, amazing. He, he just nailed it, eh? He's a great writer, yeah. but talking about how, I think it might've even been, oh no, it was, it was his band. I was wondering if it was the hip for a second, but talking about how they're used to playing in rooms with a stage that's 10 feet by 10 feet and how the natural inclination when you book a tour, I think they were opening for the hip is to kind of like, wow, we have this whole stage. We're gonna spread out and, and be 50 feet apart because we can be, but it lost the energy and eye contact and, emotional connection 
because it's too spread out. Yeah. And in a way, that's why the early days of something before anyone really knows what it is or could be, those are the best. Well, I think like it's when scale, you, right? When you get the thing, then what? Right. It's so interesting, it's though, that, that you promise pull, that you kind of know when to pull the shoot is a very interesting concept to me. Like, does do you ever do you ever take on things that fail? Heck, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the way, that, that's what I loved about doing Letterkenny is in the way that John Dunsworth savored every moment of Trailer Park Boys because he knew what it's like to be in the trenches and work at Neptune and make 50 bucks a week. And he did it for the love of the art and the stuff. He recognized what kind of lightning in a bottle Trailer Park Boys was and was always happy to be at work. That's kind of how I feel being on Letterkenny um, because it feels like Trailer Park in the early days. And it feels like, oh, these guys have lightning in a bottle too. And it's fun to know what lies ahead for them as a kind of elder statesman. Plus I just get to pop in as like weekend dad. Don't overstay yeah, my right. welcome. No diapers to change. People are happy to see me and I'm gone before um, I have to do any heavy lifting. Yeah, that part is well, well suited to being a family man too. But having that perspective of knowing that when something's cooking is very is very interesting because it does it only it happens rarely. But scale is so important. People in scale things scale up too quick. You know, I think they sometimes. do. Yeah, and then um, you don't want to be a cautionary tale or finger wagging or I guess all you hope is that people are savoring it as they're experiencing it because a good run in Canadian TV, for example six, seven years, that's a great run. Okay, now you're 27, now what, mm -hmm. right? There aren't enough guest roles on transplant to keep it going until you retire. You can't exactly coast to retirement, you know? Absolutely, you man. Well, that's why you've had to recreate your career so many times. It makes you, I mean, it keeps you really creative. Have you had mentors? Like who are the people that have helped you imagine having a career like this? Hmm. Um, I guess my earliest mentors were, there's a guy named Richard Mortimer and a woman named Lynn Harvey. They uh, produced a show called, it was a special called AIDS Care, AIDS Scare. It was a sketch comedy show about the peril surrounding AIDS for teenagers on CBC. Wow. And I know it was a different time. And it there aired. was actual went to air. sketch comedy. Dude, I wish I could find a VHS copy of this. Snow was the musical guest and it was when Informer was on the top of the charts and there was a very forward thinking CBC kids executive named uh, Peter Moss who uh, really loved the idea of speaking to kids in terms they understand and this was kind of the first wave of that infotainment he was essential in getting Street Sense going and uh, John of Vision 2 really ahead of his time so the idea of doing a comedy show about AIDS to speak to teenagers um, and hit them where they live was really wild. So I, I dressed up as a six foot six fiberglass penis and Sue Johansson, the sexpert, rolled a life-size condom over me to show how to properly use a condom. But because she's diminutive in stature, I had to lean over for her to get the condom on me, which sent a weird message about the timing of when you might um, put one on. Um, and then the only opportunity, cause Snow was arrested. It's a longer story. Snow was arrested after the dress rehearsal. The only opportunity for a promotional photograph of me with Snow was when I was in my costume before I could change. I was like, let me change real quick. They're like, this is the only window we have. So there's a picture of Snow with his arm around me doing this. And I'm dressed in a fiberglass penis costume. Canadian show business, man. So many highlights. That's amazing which is as close as I ever came to pooing myself in front of Ed Sullivan. That's the Canadian version of it. It's pretty close, man. That's incredible. That is insane. Insane. But yeah. that wasn't a, so it, Oh my gosh. I mean, do you ever consider, are there moments when you're doing that kind of thing where you're like, this might be the end. <laughs> yeah. But it's also, it's also such a, a great story. But yeah. of course, in the early 90s, you wouldn't assume this is going to live on forever on YouTube, right? 
Jono Vision isn't on CBC Gem. Um, I think there are rights issues around it, but in a way I'm thankful because maybe there's a mystique and a, a sentimental uh, feeling about it that wouldn't exist in the harsh light of day by today's standard. Right, interesting. Like we, we flew close to the sun uh, on some topics and got burnt sometimes and um, episodes didn't end up being what we'd hoped. Uh, some were much better than others. And it was definitely unique, but maybe it wouldn't hold up. So maybe it's better that it's just in the rearview mirror. Yeah, it's time and place. It was a moment. You did it, and then it's over. What about yeah. comedic inspiration? Like, who are your? Did you grow up watching comedy and watching impersonators and that kind of thing? Kids in the Hall was the first show I ever watched that I thought, for my money, these guys. I feel like I understand this language. I loved how playful they were and chippy. Um, obviously, Codco too uh from this part of the world i think andy jones is a genius and one of the most underrated uh canadian comedic performers there is um if you don't know the name uh, he's kathy jones brother in addition to many other things but he did a movie called rare birds uh with william hurt and that. it was based on a book by ed rich and andy jones stole the movie out from under william hurt it's wild wow Wow. And so they, and these were people that you were exposed to. It became well, yeah. in real life, like later on in your career. Imagine like I'm 15 years old and working at CBC Halifax and they're putting on a nightly news show and news world started in the building at the same time. This hour has 22 minutes was a brand new show in the same studio that we used. Like as a nosy sponge, it was the best. And in speaking about different ways to get to the same end result. I learned that lesson early on because after being on Street Sense for a couple of years, I wanted to do this with my life. So I called Ryerson and spoke to the registrar there and said, I want to come study radio and television art. She said, okay, why? I said, well, because I've been working and I, I absolutely love it. And she said, yeah, you're working in it. You're like, yeah, so it. that's why I want to study. You're doing it, man. Yeah, right. You don't need to come here and get a piece of paper saying carry on. So she said, show up early, stay late, ask for, to take on extra work, take criticism, say please and thank you, L like learn people's names, all the like kindergarten life stuff that has actually served me far better than a diploma saying, okay, yeah, you can, you can do <laughs> she it. She saved you a lot of time and money. No kidding. <laughs> no it's kidding. Un it's unreal. I mean, that's the thing. The CBC is such an amazing environment for that, for the mentorship for that because of its size. I mean, we were talking about how great it is. To, I, I like working on these small things, but there is a value to mentorship in big organizations. I don't mean to talk against it because well, I, tell I you do what, love it. It's an amazing thing to watch. And that wouldn't have been the same at 15 if you were just doing this. You know what I mean? That yes. you would see, you know what I mean? It was, you weren't just on your phone, just recording yourself in your room. You were then seeing a guy who was a guy, a girl who was, you know, seven years older or a little bit older, sometimes 20 years older that were really good at what they do. And it's, that goes so far. That goes no so question. far. No question. I would say the biggest trip for me at CBC in Toronto was there was an entire floor for props and staging. So uh, you could go look at a catalog of couches and say, oh, I think that couch would be funny for our sketch. Like just the, the magnitude of it and, um, you know, set pieces from Mr. Dress Up and set pieces from Wayne and Schuster and people that had worked on those things that could tell me stories. A props guy I worked with in Toronto had the original couch for two to curl up in from the friendly giant at home on his mantle. Like I've always been a student of the craft and I was really fortunate that in my teenage years uh, when the boat was a little rocky, I inherited a lot of surrogate parents who were not afraid to wrap me on the knuckles when I needed it and share wisdom and uh, love and kindness and stability. Um, so I've always been a, a CBC guy um, that really was home to me. And I was so proud to work there for so many years. It's so interesting. And they were, as you said, they were kind of like parents in some way. No question. Professional. Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy thing to be able to. I just I appreciate you taking the time to do this so much because I don't, 
I've been so curious to know how this trajectory has gone from your perspective. You know, again, I grew up with you. I grew, I grew up watching you. I've always admired you. I also think you're pretty much the funniest person I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, That's so it's, nice. Thank no, you. honestly, and I say that to everybody, I have met very few people that can make me laugh as consistently as you do all of the time. So I just, I really appreciate that. But it's been cool to just get a sense of how it works. Because again, I think it's about imagination. I think it's about people being able to see also in this region, see the crazy things can happen. Again, you said, you oh, know, must be nice. We want to get away from the must be nice. Turn on your phone, whatever, grab a microphone. It's been so great to work in like, one thing I love working with hip hop people is like hip hop is built on like ingenuity, not resources. <clears throat> It's it's creative. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's like turn the mic on and get it done. You know what I mean? And and it's about expression. And I've I got I got so much inspiration from working in that because for a long time it was like, oh no no no, you got to get the right studio, you got to be in the right place. And and so I just think it's really great to talk with different people about getting getting your hands dirty in creative pursuits. Well, Trailer Park is uh, and Mike Clattenburg specifically taught me that lesson in spades. The show looked like garbage. It was supposed to, um, but it was on a network that no one had ever heard of, Showcase. It was made in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, but it traveled and it landed and it resonated because it was funny. I always mm -hmm. say no one ever laughed at a crane shot. Um, and for the most part, that's true. But if the idea is funny, the performance is good, the words are good, if the music is catchy, the singer is believable, like that, that's it. No one's going to write something off because it wasn't recorded on a, what did you say you have? The Albatross 5100? <laughs> something like that. Yeah. 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 That, the Albatross. That's good. I always actually, speaking of music, just before we take off, but I did listen to the score yesterday. That song nice. is one of the most ridiculous <laughs> Like you rapping in the voice of Gordon Lightfoot about light like from lightfoot's perspective trying to diss bruce coburn oh the yeah, it's pretty high concept but that's my world's colliding i'm a huge lightfoot fan and um always have been uh so wanted to do some kind of rappy thing on the record and ended up reading drake and gordon lightfoot live across the street from each other in toronto like that union made us laugh so that's how we ended up there i did think the diss verse was particularly hilarious because it took me a second that you weren't moving away from bruce coburn like it was a good it's a dedicated verse to this yeah you know which so is, dumb it's so the idea yeah it's so dumb but so funny i mean dumb funny it's a very fine line that was um <laughs> i i i didn't know what was happening the entire time i'd never made a record before never imagined i would that's what i'm so thankful to this podcast for we wrote a book we made a record we got to tour all things i never thought i would do so i just kind of trusted jeremy the first day he was like i know you're a words guy don't worry about words yet just come in with vibes man i was right. like okay cool 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 come in with vibes cool 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 what does that actually mean but that was a really cool experience to watch how vibes take root i love seeing risk i love seeing risk and that whole podcast is high risk but again the what, what's the cost of failure who do you owe it to what, what do you is there some, how many bosses do you have going that joke didn't work you can't do that again or do more of that joke because that was funny it's like no, no no we're just gonna try we're gonna try whatever meet the right. post we're gonna try is that what it's called and stuff doesn't work <laughs> but it makes the stuff that does work swing that much harder it's at least we're not it's not so polished that you think there's trickery. It's out there for all to see. Well, and it, you feel like you're part of the creative experience because it feels loose enough that you feel like it was just created. It's the excitement of like improvisation. It's like, the, you know, not that the thought doesn't go into it, but you know what I mean? It's got that moment. And that's, that is the beautiful thing about art right now. And it goes back to what we were talking about, this idea of like of, of, of copying the things that are working. That's the worst thing. It's like it, as soon as that starts happening, it's dead. Whereas where you take where you feel that risk and, you know, I mean, the, what's the what's the skit about the guy who sells stuff? What's the guy's name? It's the most. Oh, Byron. By you're selling on Byron. You're selling on well, Byron. Like that's the that's one of the most. Growing up in the Maritimes, though, don't you remember um, like Swap Shop or any of those totally. radio? Like I got a pair of size seven boys, my crime skates. Looking to trade for a lab puppet? 
Like what? But In when what did you universe? come up with the name I'm you're selling on Byron? That's I can't that even joke remember. It, like blew my mind for it made me laugh for weeks. We were and we of course I'm sure lots of bands listen to your show, but literally our band would listen to this the podcast as we were traveling and be uh, that joke particularly just it made me die because I was like who whose brain thinks of something so ridiculous? So, I'm Byron. In a way, and I know you're trying to wrap it up. But the last thing I will say is Jeremy Taggart has taught me a lot about comedy because of his background as a musician. And uh, I want to produce things, polish them, move on again before the audience grows tired of it. He's like, nah, man, let's just sit in it for a bit. Let's just jam and see what happens. And sometimes having the confidence to just jam leads you to second gear in a way that you didn't see coming. Yeah, right. Love it. Unexpected, Love it. Uh, but music and his take on music has uh, helped me develop that muscle, I think. It's a great combo, man. It's a great, it's an unlikely combo, the two of you. It's interesting that you found it each sure other. sure is. You know, it's so interesting. Well, good luck with everything. I know you got a lot going on. You're starting work. You like, too. Let's make days. your show. What's that? Let's, I would let's, love it. Let's make your show. I, I let's would make your show. Let's do it. I would, I, I would be, it was a dream, man. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I live here. I go into the woods every day. I walk around for an hour and a half. I come back in here. I make music. I learn old country songs. You've won I do a life. radio show now on CKUA where I start the show and be like, hi, I'm David Miles. I'm going to start the show by singing a song. So I, and because I was like, can I, CKUA is a listener supported station in, in Alberta. It's quite a Love big it. station. It's a hundred years old. It's a really cool station. And they gave me the freedom to do this. They were like, yeah, sure. Try it out. And now it's like my, it's one of my favorite parts of the show is just trying to nail that intro of being like, we're going to get on to the next thing. But to start, I want to welcome you by singing this old song. Born to lose, I've lived my ding, 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 ding. I love it. So is that like, can that show be um, shared across the world? The, it's or on, it has to live? It's live. It lives live. So it's every week. It's a weekly radio show that broadcasts three times a week. On That's CKLA. so fun. Canadian music, all Canadian music. That's why I was listening to the score. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. There's Weekend Bumsies is our country song. Um, it's by a girl named Andrews from Cape Breton. She lives in Mississauga working at Purelators. And she wrote a song called Weekend Bumsies, loosely based on my time in Toronto when I was working on Jono Vision, how I always wondered what the people were doing back home. Because I always say I stayed in Toronto. I never lived there. So Weekend Bumsies is about Andrea being at Sneaky D's where the nachos are great. And she doesn't smoke cigarettes. But to talk to other people, she bums them on the weekend. Uh -huh. Weekend bumsy. So she goes out on the sidewalk and bums them just to have someone to talk to. That's a, that's a good um, country, country music concept. Well, you should listen to it because it has some heavy duty slide guitar in it. Um, and it, it's a classic country song. I think you dig it. I will. I'll check it out. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, I Thank really you. appreciate you doing this. Say hi to your family for me. Let's get in touch real soon, you man. Too. Let's talk about this next, our next project. Let's make your show. Let's make appreciate your show. Appreciate it, man. Let's make Thank your show. Thank you so much, dude. Love it. Thank Peace you. Peace.